I think I'm having an art attack. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Art Attack with your host, art historian Lizzie Daston, and myself, art historian. <laughs> I can. I'm an art historian. You are. I mean, I know so much about it. Like, I don't have a degree. Does a degree determine anything anymore? I mean, like, you could be know so much about art history without being an art historian. And for all the art historians out there that are actually like shivering that I said that, I, I apologize. Well, they're antiquated. It is an old system, mm. and you delve into the research. You know a lot, and so you should feel totally empowered to self-identify. Okay, I'm an art historian. <laughs> <laughs> Can I be an artist? No. So let's be real. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about uh, something that I don't really know too much about, I'm going to just talk about what I do know. We're going to talk about the Hudson River School. Uh, I grew up next to the Hudson River, by the way. And the Hudson River, I lived on West End Avenue in New York City, and the Hudson, Hudson River is the West End Avenue, Riverside, the park, and the Hudson River is right there. So that, along the Hudson River, I think it runs all the way up the to the Appalachian, am I wrong? I don't know. Mountains, I know about the all the way. Um, so... Well, the Hudson River, uh, I know that they did a lot of paintings near there. No, I don't know anything about that. But I do know that um, that landscape... So the Hudson River School is an interesting school because it's it's really a school of painters who painted landscape as their subject. Now, obviously, there was a lot of uh, history... Uh, a lot of romanticism, a lot of meaning behind it. But I just want to talk about landscape painting because at the end of the day, we could just filter it down to the fact that they are painting landscape. They're not painting figures. They're not painting portraits. And in the context of art history, as you know, landscape painting is considered way down there. So there's like still lives, the very bottom, then landscape painting, and then all the other kinds of painting, portraiture, figure, historicals at the top. But landscapes at the bottom, according to the snobbery of the art, not according to me. I hear you. I do a lot of land. I do a lot of landscapes. I have a lot of figures in landscapes. But in the context of art history, landscape is really low, which is weird but true. Right, and as you are <laughs> painting or uh, pointing to your painting of a the birth of Venus, this right. would actually be the highest of the hierarchical scale because it is a mythological painting right. with historical significance. So it's true. The salon, the big mechanism that produced paintings and was essentially the tastemaker of the day, had a scale of significance. And so history, as you mentioned, is at the top, then portrait, then I believe genre, mm -hmm. and then landscape, and then still life. So <laughs> still life's the lowest. Still life is always the worst. So Chardin, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like trash. It's yeah, so Cezanne, weird. Dead. Trash. Yeah, it's like so weird, <laughs> and it's all like you know. Obviously, uh, it's just a weird system. You know what I mean? But does it? But then before we get into the Hudson School, does that dictate? Uh, the auction house as well is that considered the same in the auction house like still life way down here and then landscape and then is it the same way I'm that they're sure yeah. just because it is, although the system is antiquated i think putting yourself in the mind of a collector it is pretty niche to want to spend a tremendous amount of money on a still life painting yeah so i just don't think that it is the most seductive way to collect but going back to this particular moment I am so excited for this episode because Woo! people hate American landscapes. And I see this as a tremendous opportunity to imbue this work that is seemingly easy to understand with gravitas and to contextualize it in a way that reanimates its significance. So mm. in... American Beautiful. art. Thank you. Beautifully said. Ah, well, let's yes. hope I can follow up with some good old content. So as soon as America is developing its character, its identity as a nation, the initial type of art that's produced is portraiture. Because if you think about the role of art at the time, it was to authenticate existence. These people don't have museums or any kind of way of publicly exhibiting their art. 
And so they want to say, this was me. I was here at this pivotal moment in the formation of a new country. And so the portrait was really the only type of art that was created as a mercantile exchange. It was not seen as a high art. It was more like a caricature that you get at the promenade, where it's just a way of recording a moment. So then that moves to history paintings when suddenly the United States has a history to paint. And so then artists like Benjamin West or Copley or Trumbull, they start to depict these moments from the American Revolution. And they're celebrating our present by honoring our recent past. But both these genres, the portrait and the history, were still tethered to Europe. And finally, in the Romantic era, when painters start to paint the landscape, this is the first moment in the trajectory of American art that we are separating ourselves from Europe. And I say that because Europe has all the history in the world. It has ruins. It has just everything in, in time, but it doesn't have the unfettered wilderness. And that's what the American landscape can offer that at least the rest of the Western world does not have access to. And so the landscape is much more than what it appears on its surface. It is American character. It is American identity. And it also aligns with our desire to expand the country and to move from the East Coast, from the colonies where we initially settled, and to have adventures and to expand westward. And so there's so much in these landscapes and the big issues that you need to have awareness of when you're looking at them is, first of all, the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution was a global phenomenon from about 1740 until 1860, but it happened later in the United States. And so with the Industrial Revolution came the rail the railroad system and came all of this conceptual desire to explore, to expand. And that's also what these landscapes are about. And in some cases, it's about a protest against industry mm. and a fear of this innovation like we have today. When are our lives going to be taken over by robots? And so some people are really excited about that technological innovation, and some people are fearful. And these landscape paintings represent that exact same moment. Yeah, they were a little bit of what we wanted to, we wanted it to be patriotic. We wanted to say, hey, look how freaking beautiful America is. Look at our landscape. It is different than Europe, but it is our own. We have a beauty. And in a lot of ways, it was such an idyllically painted beauty, you know, oftentimes stuff that was made up, but, uh, you know, stuff that really was like, God damn, that looks like paradise. It was just like paradise. It wasn't like just a normal uh, landscape of every, you know, looking out your back window. I mean, th these were epic, epic scenes, you know, and they had, like you said, they had gravity to them. Uh, they had a weight and a, a significance to them that made America, America. And also, it was an anti-urbanization movement where they were like, look how beautiful this land is, although we have stole it out from under the American Indians. But, you know, there's that running through that as well. But we are going to celebrate it with the apotheistic sky, with the corpuscular rays of light shining through uh, the beautiful you know, ceiling to the heavens. I mean, these were really almost hearkening back to the days of, of Tintoretto and Correggio, where you'd have these wonderfully beautiful renaissance and masterpieces. But this was the American version of, look at America, the beautiful, the home of the free and the brave. So there was a lot of that which could be uh, thought of as perhaps politically motivated. And a lot of it also came from or in, in 
in harmony with the writings of Emerson and Thoreau as well. Absolutely. And you brought up so many integral points. Too, too many points, let's be honest. I brought so up too many, many too great many. points, okay. all of them really <laughs> salient and deep. So your reference to paradise is completely apt. And not only did the land represent how we can separate ourselves from Europe, but it also was an extension of our spiritual faith. Because if you think about the Bible, what is the most, what is the source of a spiritual expression in the Bible? It's the Garden of Eden, right? And so the Garden that, of Earthly Delights, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe not that. That's more of a purgatory <laughs> that's very, than a heaven. That's very <laughs> but the actual Garden of Eden represents this unfettered spiritual awakening of mankind. And so America, with our landscape that is wild and untamed, that is the closest expression of a Garden of Eden that we have. And we have that as Americans. And so the land, it is God in nature, but it's also God as nature. Mm -hmm. And the land is not just the setting, but the subject. Mm -hmm. And that is a really exciting moment. And when you talk about the politicized nature of the land, that also links itself to the identity of the land being spiritual because of the concept of manifest destiny, which is such a problematic one. Basically, it was a way for these settlers to justify the displacement of indigenous peoples mm -hmm. and all under this umbrella of Christianity saying, well, this is what I have to do to expand God's word and that features prominently in a lot of these landscapes. Mm -hmm. And there are subtle compositional choices where we see this play out. For instance, on the left side of most of these landscapes, you see the wilderness. Often it's so darker. Can we talk about perhaps the Oxbow by Thomas Cole? We can, but can we get to it in okay, a minute? Okay, because you were saying on the left side, which I remember in, in that painting, it's like, thunderous and you know it's just insane a little okay, bit of let's talk about it yeah because because i think that that's the best way to get into what you're saying is through the through uh the lens of thomas cole's oxbow painting well sure thomas cole is the earliest fully realized hudson river school mm -hmm. painter the reason i didn't want to go to it right away is because he did an important series of paintings mm -hmm. prior to the oxbow mm -hmm that actually informed the oxbow, but we okay. can just go backwards. So looking at the oxbow from 1836, the left side of the composition is wild and dark, and there's a tree, I think, that's been broken, broken mm -hmm. by lightning, yep. and it feels a little bit dangerous and ominous, and there's a storm brewing. And then often in, in these compositions, there's water in the center, which represents stillness and calm and serenity. And then on the right side, you'll see something that's been cultivated. And the way that we read in Western society is left to right. Mm -hmm. And so I often read the language of these landscapes similarly, where we start from one place and then we progress to the other. Mm -hmm. And to me, that suggests that the right is more important. It's more idyllic than the left, that we want to move from this exotic primitivized uh, the the wilderness to something that's more cultivated and so that to me is a progression through manifest destiny yeah i think everything you're saying is really interesting too because you know as from an artistic point of view sometimes i look at some of these paintings and you know i don't get the feeling of naturalism that i and real realist painting like i do with a uh, gustave corbet right i feel like when i see his landscapes i'm like Wow, you're a Corot. You know, it's just like it's a different feeling. With these, I'm almost getting an illustrative sensibility. Not, I don't want to put it down to that level because we have already said that landscape is the lowest form, <laughs> but I feel like it, some of this could be a book cover. You know, it's so almost illustrative. It doesn't mean that they're not exploring atmosphere and color and really exploring uh, the deep, deep subtleties of traditional landscape plein air painting. But there's something about them that feel uh, set up. It's so it's so full of drama. It's so theatrical. Like Thomas Cole's Oxbow, like you said, one half of the painting is this. It's almost like a stage, right? And you see the storm and you see the thunder. And then the actors come in and 
it's calm and it's idyllic and there's a like there's a sense of being feeling grounded and a lot of them really feel like not paintings but illustrations of the ideology that they were trying to impose from a visual perspective. That's absolutely right. And I think the likening of this landscape and others similar to to a stage set is great. And it's true that everything is very constructed. And the separation of one side to another is symbolic of the duality of the American spirit. And this is a really random example, but I think it illustrates my point, is if you think even to the symbology of our currency so a dollar bill we have an eagle a bald eagle Mm -hmm. and do you know why the bald eagle is our national bird because he's badass well obviously but also bald meaning he doesn't have a crown Mm. and so it means that we have freed ourselves from the monarchy so the bald eagle holds two different things in its talons it holds a bundle of arrows and then it holds an olive branch And so we have that split in our identity, our consciousness as a nation from the very beginning between being rough and aggressive and militaristic and also being peaceful. Mm -hmm. And the bald eagle turns its head toward the olive branch. Mm -hmm. And so that prioritizes the peace over the aggression. And so even in these paintings, we have the peaceful, cultivized landscape as the part that we aspire to because we read from left to right, and so the right is our end result. And so I think that there's so much symbolism interlaced within these landscapes that not only do they illustrate what the land actually looked like, but much more significant than that, they illustrate the identity of the country. And in the Hudson River School, a really dynamic moment in that painting was just discovered a few years ago. So there's this art historian named Matthew Bigel, And he noticed that in the back of the mountain, in the far distance of the composition, that there is a a Hebrew lettering that's been yes, scribbled. Yes, yes, yeah. What, and do you know it, what it is? Yeah, Shaddai, Shaddai. which is the Almighty. The, yeah, which is God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how I amazing! Saw, I, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I n- never heard that, but I see it pretty clearly. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I should I read it backwards? All. Yeah, it's like yeah. backwards, yeah. Because it's from the perspective crypt- of heaven, mm-hmm. it would be normal. I get yeah. right. Yeah. Why else would it be turned? So that I thought was fascinating because, as we discussed, the landscape itself is God, is an expression, an extension of God. But this is a way to literalize that. And and um, isn't isn't Thomas Cole himself in that painting? Yes. Which makes it amazing because it shows the awesomeness and we've all experienced this, right? Like I always say that I don't feel like we experience how small we are in Los Angeles because there's so many lights. Everything is illuminated. We're kind of drowned out in light pollution. But oftentimes if you go out to the outskirts, to the beach or up somewhere where there's not a lot of light pollution, you can feel how insignificant and small you are. And by doing that, it extinguishes your ego so that you can feel how meaningless you really are. I mean, there's really the universe is big and you're just a speck of sand in the context of the universe. Uh, You feel it certainly when you're on LSD and really, 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 really high. Uh, But you also feel it in this painting. My point is that that's what he's telling us. I believe is that look at me in there, you know, painting, hanging out in this in this giant wilderness. I'm insignificant. Nature is God. You know, the Almighty is looking down upon this. The Almighty created this. I am nothing more than an insignificant human being uh, amid this incredibly epic uh, world. Comforted that comforted I am at being dust. Isn't that? What the quote is from Job? I don't know. Yeah, this this concept of being okay, surrendering to the insignificance of the self yeah. in lieu of the majesty of nature. It's and very that's exactly... ayahuasca. It's very <laughs> ayahuasca. I like all these drug references. But, but th- it's true. It's like when you see him there, you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. It's like there's no self-importance there. The importance is, you know, the sky and the sun and the earth, and it's regenerating itself. This little speck of human being, you're going to be gone. You're, you're done. You know what I mean? This is here. The universe is here. And in a way, 
you could also say that even though he's insignificant and he's put himself as a speck in this giant masterpiece of a painting, he's also part of it. He's part of the universe. He's part of what is going to be recycled back into the you know, atmosphere of time. That's a great point, that it's this synergistic relationship between man and nature. Mm -hmm. And that is an age-old trope in art, man versus nature. And whenever you see a natural landscape and man, it's kind of fun to figure out Mm. the power divide between the two. Is nature winning? Is man trying to control? And in this rendering by Cole, it feels like harmony. Yeah, and and we see it, like you said. You see it in... uh, Jericho's The Raft of Medusa. Uh, you see it in a lot of Winslow Homer's paintings where it's man at the sea and the sea is about to swallow you know, him up or them up. Historically, we see it, but we see it in a different way here. We see man versus ma- nature, man with nature, man and nature. You know, it's, it's, it, it's very layered and complicated and and freaking complex. I mean, Cole, and on top of that, let's just say Cole was a hell of a painter. You know, some of these Hudson River guys could have been portrait guys. They could have been historical, mythological painters who made a lot of money. And at the end of the day, the Hudson River School is a bleep in art history. Oh, it's, barely. Yeah, nobody it's not likes even, talking about nobody it. Nobody <laughs> likes talking about it. It's quite boring. Uh, it's quite insignificant. It had its moment, and then it just, you know, ebbed right away. It was like, Hudson River, hey, man, that... You know what I mean? But it's true. It's like, when you when I talk to my fellow painters and, and some art historians, I talk about the Hudson River School, and they're either saying, what's that? Or, oh, yeah, that movement? And so you're like, huh, that's interesting. But where does it fall in the context of art history? Well, I think it falls at the most significant moment of American art as the United States is separating itself from the confines of Europe. And even in this hierarchy that you've been discussing between history at the top and still lives at the bottom, the Americans who are painting at this time, like Cole, they thought, well, for us, the landscape is the absolute top because the landscape is this most spiritual and the landscape is what we have that you don't. And so they're not acknowledging the mediocrity of how the genre is seen in Europe, they're actually shifting the hierarchy and changing it for their purposes. So this was seen as the most religiously significant, the most propagandistically significant too in a certain way since we're talking about justifying this displacement and manifest destiny and the racism and the genocide that followed. And so this is the highest expression of American identity. And so how, uh, and just to close it up, how did it end? Like, and what did it lead into? Cause I don't know. I don't, I don't know how Hudson river school stopped. And then where did, where did we take it from there? Did it, did it lead into something else? Yeah, that's a great question. So the landscape is the subject in these works And then eventually this pivots to genre paintings where the landscape still is prominent, but the figures who are so small in the oxbow suddenly become a more central subject. So this shifts from landscape to genre. And a genre, what that means is an everyday scene involving everyday people. And so often these are paintings by people like Mount or Bingham, and they celebrate the antebellum South. So that is where this work shifts to. And the landscape is also important, but it doesn't have this sense of majesty, the sense of adventure, and the sense of needing, aching to be explored. So check out the Hudson River School if you're listening to this. And if you're on YouTube, obviously, you're seeing all of these amazing paintings going down. And the only thing we really ask from our viewers is to leave us a review. Uh, If you guys enjoy the podcast, please just write something sparkling, shiny, five-star-ish about us. And Tommy Johnning, if you guys also like great underwear that holds your junk firmly, (laughs) uh, it's really the best underwear. I wear it every day. It's Tommy John. And if you go to Tommy John and you go to checkout, all you have to do is enter 
the words Art Attack, which is, of course, our show, and you will receive 20% off of probably the greatest underwear that I've ever worn in the history of my life. And then you can twin with Justin Bua. Twinning! Twinning.